Okay. All right. Well, it is 8 a.m. Um, and so we will kick off our grand rounds today. I am uh, delighted uh, to um, uh, have a guest speaker. And I, I'm sorry, how do you pronounce your last name? I should have asked you this um, right before. I apologize. No worries. Inanya. Inanya. So yeah. Dr. Inanya, who is at the uh, University of Pennsylvania, and to introduce her, uh, Dr. Micah Chen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. It's my pleasure and privilege to have Dr. Inanya here with us. Just a brief uh, background. She did her uh, uh, Bachelor's of Arts at Cornell, then went on to med school at Meharry Medical College, continued on her graduate study at uh, Harvard uh, for her MPH, did her intern training at the Brigham and residency and fellowship all at the Brigham, continued on as instructor of medicine then assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and Mass General, and then to her current position as assistant professor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, we are just uh, very happy that she can come and talk to us on controversies in medicine, lessons learned from using race to manage kidney disease. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. And, you know, it's a shame that I can't um, oops, be there in person today, but I'm honored um, to discuss something that's gained so much attention, not only domestically, but internationally as well. And that is the use of race um, in EGFR equations and, and using it to manage kidney disease. So I'll leave this up for two more seconds and progress. So here are my financial disclosures. Just one, I'm a scientific advisor for DeVita. It's not related to the content of this talk. But more importantly, I think it's, it's nice to start off this talk by discussing life disclosures. So currently I'm an NIH funded researcher on um, clinical trials that are focused on decision-making, palliative care, quality of life, and health equity for kidney disease. And so how did I become kind of one of the central figures in EGFR equations? That's not something that I've ever you know, specifically trained in in terms of my research. So I wanted to share some life disclosures. First, you know, I identify as a Black woman. I'm a Black nephrologist. And so I've diagnosed and managed kidney disease among thousands and thousands of Black patients in my career. I'm also a first-generation Nigerian-American. And so we were discussing how to, to pronounce my name, um, but my parents come from Nigeria. Um, and so a lot of the discussion has raised the point of using ancestry in EGFR equations and what that means. And specifically in Nigeria, um, actually kidney disease is endemic. And so uh, the specific village that I'm from um, has high proportions of patients with chronic kidney disease. And unfortunately they don't have the, the same therapies that we have. And so it's really like a death sentence over there. Um, speaking of which, I have a family history of kidney disease and I've had members of my family be personally affected by the use of race and EGFR equations. And then I studied black sociology in college. And so my honors thesis was focused on racial segregation among black students on campus. And so I've really been thinking about race since I was a teenager um, and how I can apply that to medicine. And then I went on to receive my medical education from a historically black college, Meharry Medical College, which is the first HBCU in the South to grant degrees to African-American physicians when they were denied entry from white medical schools. And so really learning um, how to take care of underserved patients is the, is the mission of Meharry Medical College. And then lastly, again, I'm a health equity researcher. And so I'm applying all of these life disclosures to my current uh, work is, has been really important to me. And this is why when this controversy was raised, I really couldn't uh, walk away from it, right? I really felt like it was my life's work to really take this on. So objectives of this talk will be to first discuss structural racism and its impact on Black individuals in the United States. Then I'll move on to discussing the history of estimating glomerular filtration rate equations. And then I'll describe pitfalls of using race and estimating glomerular rate equations. And lastly, explain future approaches, including the kind of hot off the press uh, recommendations from the uh, National Kidney Foundation and American Society of Nephrology uh, Race and EGFR Task Force, of which I'm proud to sit on. I do want to say that everything in this talk is not a reflection of any task force deliberations or discussions, and they're really of my uh, own scientific uh, scholarship and advocacy. 
And so I always like to start off my talks with a clinical case to give you a bit more context into the discussion. So this is a woman who I saw on the inpatient dialysis service, patient MB. She was a 24 year old female with a history of sickle cell anemia, pulmonary hypertension, cerebral aneurysms, a kidney failure and hemodialysis who was presenting with pain. On physical exam, she was noted to be quite hypertensive and she was hypoxic needing uh, oxygen setting 95% on two liters. And her physical exam was notable for her being in, in pretty moderate respiratory distress and she had this profound bilateral lower extremity edema. Her laboratory, her labs showed that her hemoglobin was 4.8 below her baseline of about six. She was hyperkalemic and her chest x-rays showed these small bilateral pleural effusions. So our assessment of this patient was a woman who uh, has end-stage kidney disease or kidney failure and dialysis presenting in volume overload and sickle cell pain crises. And so we admitted her for blood transfusion, pain control, and dialysis treatments. So a little bit more about her social history. Um, she did not have a primary care clinician and she was kind of bouncing around seeing different hematologists across several cities in Pennsylvania. She also had an unstable living environment. And so she didn't have a physical address and live between um, family members and friends was kind of couch surfing, living in halfway homes. And lastly, she was also a single mother. Um, she had two young daughters and the father was currently in prison. It was actually incredibly hard to reach anybody um, to discuss this patient when trying to call her family members, her mother in particular, no one would, would answer the phone. And so you can really see that she had minimal support in her life. And so I took a step back and I looked just beyond the previous admission or maybe even two admissions prior to her presentation as I typically do for patients who appear to have high social needs. And I noted that she'd been admitted 18 times over a two and a half year period, all for the same diagnosis of sickle cell pain crisis. Some of these uh, admissions you can see were separated only by a few weeks. And so as I was reading through the chart, I was just looking through some of her progress notes, her discharge notes, social work notes, and a, and a few words kept jumping out and I'll share them with you. Poor insight, non-adherent, unlikely to be sickle cell pain, missed dialysis, poor compliance, over-medicated with pain meds. And lastly, you know, this is, is, is quite comical, this, this kind of rubber stamp we put on all of our discharge paperwork that the patient was discharged to home in good condition, which obviously was not the case for this patient, as you can see, she was admitted so frequently. And so as we move on with this discussion, I'll kind of pose the question to the audience, what's the best treatment plan for this patient? But more importantly, does one already feel like they already kind of know this patient by reading about her previous admissions and what kind of biases have been formed even before you meet the patient or talk to the patient? Um, do you already feel like you, you have a good sense, um, especially looking at those pejorative words and phrases? So I'll let you think on that as we move on with the discussion. So let's talk about structural racism. Structural racism as defined by Dr. Nancy Krieger at Harvard University is a totality of ways in which societies foster racial discrimination via mutually reinforcing inequitable systems, such as housing, education, and so on, that in turn reinforce discriminatory beliefs, values, and distribution of resources reflected in history, culture, and interconnected institutions. So essentially, structural racism is a system of hierarchical opportunity that is based solely on phenotypic appearance, the race being a social construct, and it unfairly disadvantages individuals of minority racial and ethnic backgrounds, but also unfairly advantages certain individuals, namely in this country, white individuals. And so let's look at the impact of structural racism. So on the left here is a graph from the US Census Bureau, and we can see median household income by race and Hispanic origin, and you can see these trends over time. Uh, for instance, in 2018, the median household income for an Asian household was 87,000 versus 70,000 for non-Hispanic whites versus 51,000 for Hispanic individuals and 41,000 for uh, Black individuals. And on the right, we have a, a figure from Pew Research Center. And for those who are not familiar with Pew Research, they're a nonpartisan think tank that publishes on social demographic trends in the United States. They have excellent work. I would encourage everyone to look at it. And these are trends in median net worth over time. And we define net worth as the total market value of all tangible and intangible assets minus all debts. So you can see in 2013, as uh, for a white household, the median net worth is 142 versus 11,000 for black individuals. 
and 14,000 for Hispanic individuals. And this is really unchanged over time. And you can see that these curves for both household income and median net worth are quite parallel. They're not converging, they don't intersect. What's also notable are these vertical gray columns, which represent periods of economic recession. And specifically for Black and Hispanic individuals, their post-recession uh, values for household income and net worth and so on do not rebound nearly as quickly to pre-recession values compared to white individuals and Asian individuals, which I think is very, very important given the economic recession that we're currently in. And so this is another graph from Pew Research Center. And these are educational disparities. The, this uh, represents the proportion of US adults who are age 25 and older who have at least a bachelor's degree. You can clearly see racial and ethnic disparities here. As of 2015, 53% of Asians had received a bachelor's degree versus 36% of whites, 23% of blacks, and 15% of Hispanics. So what am I really trying to show you here when I'm showing you these sociodemographic trends? Well, I'm showing you the impact of structural racism that results in the inequitable distribution of power and resources that closely track along racial and ethnic lines. And I wanna contrast that to biological differences, which we'll get to in a second, but we know from significant literature that uh, the social determinants of health, which the, the World Health Organization defines as the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age are highly associated with disparities and health outcomes. So I've shared a bunch of these with you, but income, education, racial segregation, and I can give you an, another full complete talk about how these are all associated with disparities um, and health outcomes, including mortality. So let's get back to the clinical case. Um, so to wrap up, we, we needed to, I needed to phone a friend. Um, it's not rocket science, but that actually had not been done very efficiently in her previous admissions. And so we convened social work, case management, and psychiatry. And psychiatry was actually key in this case because um, this patient had under-recognized and under-treated um, anxiety and a mood disorder. And a lot of uh, children who have chronic diseases like her struggle with mood disorders and, and having a lot of anxiety. And so we actually used an atypical antipsychotic, which was very effective for her. And we tried to shift her cognitive framework to focusing on transplant, which is actually something that was a viable option for her um, because she was quite young and otherwise um, pretty healthy outside of her, of her uh, kidney failure. But the goal again for, for showing you this case is to, to really um, demonstrate that it's not a patient's fault when they present like this. And, and on the wards, I was hearing a lot from other team members that it was her, she was a frequent flyer, she's so difficult, but really she's a victim of structural racism. Um, and that we as academic institutions or institutions that have significant resources should just pour them into these patients to really you know, start to move the needle when it comes to racial disparities. So let's switch gears and talk about the history of EGFR equations. So what is EGFR? So this is my favorite slide as a nerdy nephrologist to discuss like what is GFR, glomerular filtration rate? And we'll go back to renal pathophysiology in medical school. So the glomerulus is a collection of capillaries in the nephron and blood flows through the glomerulus from the afferent arterial through the efferent arterial. And that filtrate from that blood collects in Bowman's capsule shown here. And so one glomerulus plus one Bowman's capsule equals one renal corpuscle. And GFR is actually the total volume of filtrate among all renal corpuscles in both kidneys per minute. So you can imagine how difficult it is to actually determine uh, someone's kidney function at the bedside, their, how well their kidneys are filter, or filtering their blood. And so EGFR were uh, equations that were developed to allow for the indirect assessment of GFR using endogenous filtration markers that we all have, creatinine and cystatin C, without the need for obtaining urinary or even uh, blood clearance measurements, which can be quite unwieldy um, when you, if you really need to measure GFR. And so we also know that there are variables that are associated with endogenous filtration markers that cannot be easily measured. We call these non-GFR determinants. And these would include things that affect the generation and tubular filtration and secretion of the marker. We also know that there's certain demographic and clinical variables that are associated with certain endogenous filtration markers. 
And so EGFR equations are essentially multivariable linear regression models that relate observed GFR to observed serum concentrations of filtration markers, while also accounting for the demographic and clinical variables that we know can impact those filtration markers. So we'll do a deep dive into the first EGFR equation study, the MDRD study um, that was led by Dr. Andrew Levy, who's now at Tufts University, uh, Tufts Medical Center, and we'll discuss this in detail. So MDRD, which stands for the Modification of Diet and Real Disease Study, was actually a, a prospective trial that was started in the uh, early 90s that was focused on the effect of protein restriction, phosphorus restriction on the progression of chronic kidney disease. And everybody in that prospective trial had measurement of, of GFR using an exogenous filtration marker, iiothalamate, which is our gold standard. And so out of those trial participants, 1,628 participants were selected to be in the MDRD study. And stepwise multiple regression was used to determine a set of variables that best predicted GFR together. And you can see the variables that were considered for possible inclusion listed here, weight, height, sex, ethnicity, which we now know was actually race in this study, serum creatinine, and so on. And so here is kind of the crux of why we have race and EGFR equations. And that was racial differences in the relationship between creatinine and measured GFR. So you can see on the X axis, this is GFR. And on the Y axis, we have serum creatinine concentration. We have women on the left and men on the, on the right. And what you can, these, um, these curves, these solid curves represent black individuals and the dotted curves represent white individuals. And you can see for both women and men at any given measured GFR, serum creatinine was significantly higher among black participants compared to white participants. So they did note this finding. And so that was, they, they were left scratching their heads and to facilitate the clinical in interpretation, these results were re-expressed in terms of regression coefficients that referred to change in geometric mean GFR associated with unit changes in the independent variable. And they tested multiple equations. You know, we don't have time to go through all these equations, but I'll draw your attention to this, five, to this uh, far right column over here, which showed the multiplication factor for GFR for equation seven, which turned out to be the final equation. And you can see here for sex, the multiplication factor is 0 0.76 for females and for black individuals, it's 1.18, meaning that for a black individual, if they have an EGFR compared to a white individual, their EGFR will be 18% higher than any uh, non-black or white individual. And so the study conclusions was that this was great. This is a huge win for nephrology. Um, we, they found uh, an equation that predicted GFR rather than creatinine clearance, which had been used previously to the study. We had been using the krakow galt equation. Um, it was a validated method for measuring GFR using i alphalamate and that the variables that they, that they imputed into the equation um, could be easily reported in any medical system. And I forgot to mention that the six variables that came from the study were uh, serum creatinine, BUN, albumin, age, sex, and race. And so this was, again, a huge win for, uh, for nephrology. They also noted that including a term for Black ethnicity was actually important because uh, individuals of Black race had more prevalent chronic renal disease, and that's still the case to this day, especially for advanced kidney disease. So they actually thought that it was a strong point to include um, Black race for uh, in this equation. And so if it was such a big win for the field, then why did it turn into a controversy and why is it still being challenged to this day? Well, first, there was a lack of racial diversity in this specific study. So of, among the 1,600 or so participants, only 197 were Black. That's about 12% of the study population. But this is the biggest challenge. And that was the assertion as to why Black individuals had higher serum creatinine levels at any given measure GFR compared to white individuals. And they said that previous studies have shown that on average, black persons have greater muscle mass than white persons. And they, they used three references to support this assertion. I and mean, I'll quickly review them for you. They were very small studies and published in the early 70s to early 1990s. The first was a body composition study that was published within a pediatric population. So among 240 children, they found that black children had less body fat compared to white children. 
The next study was a body chemical composition study that was conducted among adults, and they found that compared to age and sex matched white adults, black adults had total had higher levels of total body potassium and um, elemental calcium. And the last study was a, was a study of 60 or so healthy hospital workers, and they found that Black hospital workers had higher levels of serum creatine kinase. And this was used to, again, support the assertion that Black individuals have greater muscle mass than white persons. So just kind of taking a few steps back, that's not true. There have been no studies to show that on average or on any, there's no details at all to show that black individuals as a racial group have more muscle mass than any other racial group. That's one. And you actually can't directly measure somebody's muscle mass. Any study that has tried to, to look at muscle mass have either done body compositional studies or used some type of radiological imaging to, uh, to estimate um, uh, body mass. And again, we actually didn't have any estimates of body mass in this study, right? Any of the variables that I showed you, there were no kind of body compositional um, uh, studies outside of height and weight that were used in this equation. So they actually really didn't know what that looked like for the black participants in the study. And so here's the evolution of EGFR equation. So after that MDRD study was published in 1999, the authors then published an abstract, actually not another study that narrowed that six variable equation to four. And the four variables that they narrowed it down to were age, sex, serum creatinine, and race. And that black race coefficient was 1.21, so slightly higher than the 1.18 that was used in the six variable equation. And then 10 years later, the CKD epi study was published um, by Dr. Andrew Levy and, and his um, group again. This time, they looked at a significantly larger cohort of patients, 12,000 or so. There was more variety in terms of kidney disease. They had patients that had normal kidney function as opposed to MDRD, which had only chronic kidney disease. And there was a significantly higher proportion of black patients. So 31% of that population and that black race coefficient was still significant. They found the same differences and it was 1.16. And then in 2012, Dr. Leslie Inker, who's also a Tufts Medical Center validated Cystatin C, another endogenous biomarker in the CKD epi equation and found that there actually was no racial difference when looking um, at Cystatin C and measured GFR between black and non-black participants. But they found that when you combine creatinine into statin C, which is actually the most accurate equation, that there were still racial differences, but the black race coefficient was significantly smaller than using creatinine alone at 1.08. You know, I do want to note that a lot of the controversy has centered on, you know, if we change uh, the black race coefficient, if we remove it from the original CKD epi equation, that there's going to be significant variability for our patients. But I do want to show you the lay of the land as of the College of American Pathology 2019 Clinical Chemistry Survey, which shows significant variation in which EGFR equation is used. And even though we have international guidelines that recommend implementation of the CKD epi equation, which is slightly more accurate than MDRD, a, sig a significant proportion of institutions still report some form of MDRD, whether that's four variable equation versus six. Some institutions are even still using Krakow Gulp. And so um, there's really already significant variability as it stands for measuring, for detecting kidney disease and, and uh, managing kidney disease across the country. So what are the reasons for the racial differences that were noted um, in uh, serum creatinine levels and, and in these creatinine-based equations? Well, we know for a fact that muscle mass can affect creatinine. Anything that affects the excretion of creatinine or generation and tubular secretion, we classically think of medications like Bactrim that would interfere with tubular secretion that falsely elevates creatinine levels independent of kidney function. And there are also non-biological processes that uh, we know can affect serum creatinine levels. More uh, specifically, cooked meat or processed meats, having diets um, and, and, and meat can elevate your serum creatinine as well. And this is the million dollar question. We still actually don't know why those differences were seen in the MDRD and CKD epi and even the Crick equation studies. But we also know that the things that definitively affect creatinine were not accounted for in any of those equation studies. So that remains to be seen. So 
we just published this uh, Nature Reviews Nephrology piece, which really tries to kind of get at that question and to think more critically going forward about how we think about racism and the effects of um, kidney pathophysiology. And so we use this figure to kind of demonstrate that the, the inequitable distribution of social determinants of health among Black individuals, for instance, less access to appropriate housing, higher food insecurity, barriers to health insurance and health care, can cause lifestyle implications, so a high ingestion of cooked meat, hyperglycemia, high blood pressure, poor control of these comorbidities, which could lead to uh, increased allostatic load, which is activation of neurohormonal systems um, as an adaptation to chronic stress, um, altered gene ex expression, increased sympathetic nervous system activity, altered metabolism of, of insulin and other hormones, which then could lead to hypofiltration, EGFR decline, and RAAS activation and inflammation. And so really starting to think about not just skin color leading to differences in serum creatinine or measured GFR, what have you, but really the impact of racism among oppressed individuals is where we're seeing the effect on kidney pathophysiology. And so another thing that we thought about when we're, when we're thinking about how we apply these EGFR equations so widely is population health. <clears throat> and a, a big kind of pushback from a lot of naysayers who felt that using race was appropriate in this was that it's a population health based tool. It was developed at the population level. And so there's definitely going to be some individual in variability when we apply it to uh, black individuals or, or uh, individuals of different race. And so you know, if we're thinking about population health, shouldn't we be thinking about who we're actually including in these studies and how that is representative of the total population that you're trying to apply them to? So let's look at the CKD epi cohort. So again, that was a, a population that was significantly larger than the MDRD population and 31% uh, or so are black patients were included. Of those black patients, 70% were from a tr another perspective trial called the African American Study of Kidney Dise Disease and Hypertension Cohort Study. And that was a perspective trial that looked at the effect of blood pressure um, control on the progression of hypertensive kidney disease. And so let's look at that table one and see what those participants looked like. So I'll, I know this is a busy table one, but I'll draw your attention to a few points here. You can see at the trial baseline, um, which again, it started as a clinical trial and then subsequently became a, a longitudinal cohort that 50% of individuals um, were making an income less than 14, less than 15,000 and 41,000 for the longitudinal cohort. And 41% uh, had not graduated high school. And so what's really interesting is that, that the US Census Bureau published a report on poverty right around the time this study was published and that the CKD epi study was published. And you, you can actually look at that report and note that for black households, that uh, this income was is not representative of US, uh, for blacks living in the US at the time. And this is an overrepresentation of poverty in the uh, ASK cohort. And so thinking about how that can affect, for instance, the results if the majority of black participants in CKD epi were impoverished, then what does that look like in terms of the diet that they were eating? Um, what type of occupations were they working or are they working occupations that could result in more muscular physique? Or what other systems of oppression are you know, affecting again, kidney pathophysiology? So we wrote about this and thinking about how we can do population health studies and really thinking about instead of doing what the NIH asked us to do when we're applying for grants or if we're doing progress reports, which is report kind of the raw number of uh, Asians and blacks and whites uh, or females, but why don't we actually start to incorporate social determinants of health and cutting across socioeconomic strata? So actually incorporating um, individuals of, that who are impoverished and wealthy within the racial group. So we actually have a nice range um, and that we, since we know that the social determinants of health, again, can lead to racial disparities, we should be actually recruiting in our clinical trials to be more, uh, rep to have more representation if we're going to apply these population health studies very broadly to the population. So I would encourage everyone to read this editorial. So let's switch gears and talk about the consequences of using race and EGFR equations. So 
Another piece that's been widely missed in the controversy, in my opinion, is implicit and explicit bias. And so let's define that. Implicit bias refers to the unconscious attitudes and stereotypes that we carry with us that impact how we act, make decisions and view the world. We know that implicit bias has been associated with physician and patient communication, adherence to recommendations and follow-up care. I wanna contrast that with explicit bias, which is conscious and controlled acts. And so we also know that um, actually there was some, some recent literature that showed that explicit bias has definitely made it into the medical chart for Black individuals. That just came out this week. There's a health affairs article that shows that pejorative words um, are used um, much more frequently in Black uh, individuals uh, compared to white individuals um, when we're uh, looking at their, their health care. And we also know that implicit bias is also disproportionately affect, affects Black individuals thinking about maternal fetal health outcomes and how they are poor for Black women and they are specifically associated with implicit bias. Now, I do want to look at this graph here on the right which is from the implicit association test. It was developed at Harvard. I would encourage everyone to go to, uh, to check out this test. It's free. You can identify any unconscious biases that you have with regard to um, sex, race, uh, gender, or uh, religious reasons. And we can see here that among all uh, participants who took this test between 2002 and 2015, Aggregate scores show that there's a strong, moderate, and slight automatic preferences for white American versus black American. And you don't see that same association for black American versus white American. So among all people who take this test in the United States, we still have this kind of implicit bias towards white individuals. And that again is not all racial groups, not just white, um, but it just shows you the power of implicit bias. So what does this mean for nephrology? Well, for race and EGFR equations, Clinicians are left to judge a patient's physical characteristics, which is that's what race is, to determine which EGFR calculation to use. That is explicit bias. That is a conscious and controlled act. The majority of us are not taking our time to ask an individual what race they identify with. And so you're, you're, you're guessing, right? You're judging or you're quickly looking in the chart and it's unclear how the race gets into the chart. But it's really unclear how false beliefs regarding biological differences influences clinical care. And that would be an, as, an implicit bias, right? So we've been taught for several decades that Black individuals as a whole have more muscle mass than any other racial group. So if you're thinking about what does that do to your medical management, you can do a quick search for um, muscular and look for synonyms. And you'll find online athletic, brawny, powerful, right? What kind of implicit bias is happening when you're looking at your black patient who is at risk or has kidney disease and you're using that EGFR equation with them? How does that change your dosing of medications, your timing of referrals? It's unclear, but it's likely not good based on other literature. So some pitfalls of using EGFR equations in addition to bias are we have international guidelines that kind of tell us how to use these GFR equations to manage our patients. So for instance, the KDEGO guidelines, which are international guidelines, recommend referral for uh, to see a nephrologist once somebody's GFR is less than 30. So most individuals do not have access again to GFR, so they use eGFR. And we also have uh, national policies that say that an individual can gain kidney transplant waitlist time once their GFR is equal to or less than 20. So again, individuals are using eGFR because they don't have access to GFR. And if you're assigning Black individuals higher GFR, then they have to um, wait to see nephrology care or wait to gain waitlist time uh, because it's higher than any other racial group. There's delay in referral for kidney failure care. We have Again, national initiatives to push for early education, early decision-making, that is where my research falls to determine, does a patient want in-center dialysis, home dialysis, non-dialysis, you know, a conservative kidney management, um, early creation of fistulas, um, in which we know that there's already significant disparities that um, are, are currently present for black individuals in particular who are likely to start dialysis with a catheter compared to an ideal fistula. Um, there are also disparities in black individuals being more likely to have in-center dialysis when we know that there's benefits to physical function and quality of life for home dialysis. And so there are already existing disparities, but again, assigning black individuals higher EGFR only delays this care. 
There could be improper dosing of pharmacologic treatments, so inappropriately high dosing of treatments for Black individuals. And then importantly, we don't have an accommodation for patients of mixed race and ethnicity. I tell the story of this woman who I came across who was receiving her care. I was not caring for her, but she had advanced kidney disease and she was a black woman. She identified as black, phenotypically looked black, but had one black parent and one white parent and being well-informed, she asked her clinician, can I use my white side to get listed earlier? And they let her do it, right? Because we don't have an accommodation for people like her or anyone else who has mixed race or ethnicity. And then again, my research um, falls into shared decision-making, informed decision-making. And this is the violation of one of the central principles of shared decision-making. And that is a lack of transparency. We're not telling our patients that we're doing this behind their back, using race to guide their clinical care. Um, and, and that's really just, um, just terrible. So the counter argument, Every controversy has an, an, another side. And the counter argument is that if we remove this race correction that does more accurately predict better kidney function, then Black patients may have an overdiagnosis of chronic kidney disease. They may receive treatments such as dialysis and kidney transplant, transplantation when they don't need it. They might receive inappropriately low dosing of pharmacologic medications, lose access to crucial medications like SGLT2 inhibitors or metformin, or become ineligible to donate kidneys. Now, of course, I'm biased. I'll say that I think that this argument is extremely weak. And the reason that I say that is it's built on the premise, by the way, that Black individuals, again, have separate kidney function or different kidney function than every other racial group. And that's why you think that they would be harmed by removing this race correction. The other reason why I think this argument is flawed is that um, we have other ways of ascertaining someone's kidney function, right? We have 24-hour creatinine clearance. We have cystatin C. So there's other ways to kind of get at these nuances. If you're really um, struggling with the creatinine and how accurate it is, you can have, uh, there's other methods to confirm someone's kidney function. And that's actually in our international guidelines to actually confirm someone's kidney function with creatinine clearance or cystatin C if there's a question of whether the creatinine-based EGFR is accurate. And so there is a study that was published um, late in 2020 that really described what would happen if we remove race correction from the CKD epi equation, for instance, how many individuals would be impacted who would have a new diagnosis of chronic kidney disease. And, and they kind of projected that 1 million black individuals would now have a new diagnosis of kidney disease, but significantly less would, have, would be affected by these other points. And we kind of countered in our editorial, shouldn't we be thinking of, of first doing no harm, right? So let's say that there was some quote harm that was introduced by taking out race from these equations. Shouldn't we be focused on on the 1 million Black individuals who we know are at high risk of progressing much more rapidly to kidney failure than any other racial group due to structural racism, shouldn't we be focused on identifying kidney disease very early for those millions as opposed to the several thousands who may lose medications or may re receive uh, inappropriately low dosing of medications? And again, we have other ways of assessing someone's kidney function to really help us guide that type of management. So I would encourage everyone to read that JAMA popular where they have these projections um, by James Dio and others, as well as our editor, our accompanying editorial. And so in 2019, I published um, with uh, Dr. Peter Reese and Dr. Peter Yang at Penn, um, really a, a perspective, a viewpoint in JAMA discussing how race should not be used in easier for our equations. And we postulate the following. Race should be used to guide clinical care only if it confers substantial benefit, the benefit cannot be achieved through other feasible approaches. Patients who reject race categorization are accommodated fairly and the use of race is transparent. I always get a question when I read this, like when is it actually appropriate? And I think, in a pro first of all, it shouldn't be used automatically and, um, and secretly, that's one. And number two, another way that we could use it is, is currently how a lot of people are kind of targeting um, certain populations for vaccine use, right? P patients that don't have certain access to the vaccine or may not have um, access to the information about the vaccine, using race to kind of, you know, detail those interventions to improve vaccine uptake is a very appropriate use of, of race to guide clinical care. So update in future directions. Let's move on to the, the outcome of the National Kidney Foundation and American Society Joint Task Force. So again, I was, I was proud to sit on this task force. And more importantly, we had 
two patient members who I deeply, deeply valued their viewpoints. I think we all did because they really brought us back to where this really matters and that is the patient. And so we can have people arguing um, about how, what we should do with race and EGFR, but at the end of the day, many of us may not know what that feels like to have kidney disease and live through that experience. And so having the patient center, uh, having the patient's voice at the center is incredibly powerful and um, necessary. And so this is just to show kind of the process of the task force. Um, we had experts from all over the globe come and present on things like uh, lab assay standardization, health equity, racism. We had all, all we had hundreds of, of experts come to present. Um, and we looked at emerging research. We had these public forums, patient trainee and clinician forums, where people kind of gave these public testimonials about. The, how they felt about race and EGFR, and largely many people felt that it should be removed. And we also talked about the consequences, right? What would happen um, if we removed uh, race from reporting? How would that affect medical medication initiation, clinical trial eligibility, and recruitment, population tracking, and et cetera? And then we, you know, we had our deliberations. And so overall, we had uh, 26 approaches, if you count MDRD and CKD EPI separately, to consider how we would move forward. And we, we considered um, approaches that looked that reported race. Um, we considered uh, approaches that had like a, a low and a high value instead of race or uh, equations that actually did not have any black individuals in the development of race. We also looked at um, different biomarkers, namely cystatin C. And uh, we looked at the original CKD epi equations refit without a race variable. So going all the way back to the development population and just removing the race, the race variable. And of course, that equation floated to the top. And we have our new CKD epi 2021 equation that's refit without race. So I was a proud, proud member to be on this author list. Um, led by Dr. Leslie Inker. Again, I am not an equation person. She is, um, as well as uh, Dr. Uh, Koresh and others who have significantly more expertise and really um, taught me so much about this. And we looked at this study because we knew that race was being scrutinized, that it's wrong, it should not be used. And we wanted to evaluate the accuracy of current guideline recommended GFR equations and compare them with new equations that do not use race. This is just to show you the uh, development populations and how we assess GFR. So for the 2009 um, development population that was, again, from the CKD epi study, they did urinary clearance of iothalamate. Then we also combined that with the 2012 cystatin C development population, which had urinary clearance of iothalamate. And then we had a new 2021 external validation group that had a variety of methods of, um, of measuring GFR, so plasma clearance of IOHexol, creatinine EDTA, um, as, your, as well as urinary clearance of, of creatinine EDTA. And so we assessed seven equations. Um, the current status quo equations were, were the 2009 CKD epi creatinine equation, the cystatin C equation in 2012, as well as the combined creatinine cystatin C equation in 2012. Then we also looked at what would happen if we take the race coefficient out and reported the non-black um, value for everybody and what that would look like for both creatinine um, and the combined creatinine and cystatin C. And then we also looked at the new 2021 equations with creatinine and the creatinine cystatin C combination. So I wanna just quickly pivot and talk about performance of EGFR equations because this is actually incredibly important to this controversy. And so I wanna draw your attention to this statistical value called the P30. And P30 in this context represents the proportion of EGFR estimates that fall within 30% of measured GFR. So you can see here overall for CKD epi versus MDRD, what that P30 is, and it's not 100. There's a reason why there's an E before GFR. It's an estimate, right? There's not a hard and fast cell because we know that there's some estimates that fall outside of 30% of measured GFR, and that is not clinically acceptable. So for CKD epi, it performs better than the MDRD equation. Um, but you can also see that as you move up and down the EGFR spectrum, 
that that actually decreases. So we can see it with the EGFR is greater or equal to 260, that there's higher performance compared to lower, lower performance as we move down the EGFR spectrum, which is actually where we make most of our clinical decisions. Many of us are not making clinical decisions or changing our clinical decisions when the GFR or EGFR is higher than 60. Back to the study. Um, this is a very busy table one, but I'll show you that uh, we really wanted to focus on the proportion of Black individuals in each development set. So for the CKD Epi 2009 cohort, it was, as I mentioned, 30, 32%. Um, and for the 12, 12, 2012 Cystatin C cohort, it's, it's 40% versus 14% for the external validation data set. So here's kind of the main point or the main comparisons of these equations, and I'll walk you through this. So here on the x-axis, we have uh, our, our um, EGFR and our measured GFR on the y-axis. And these, um, these terms bias uh, relates to the difference between um, EGFR and measured GFR. The P30 we already went over, and I'll tell you that it's clinically acceptable to have a P30 that's greater than 80, but it's preferred to have a P30, um, it's ideal to have a P30 that's, that's 90 or above. And correct classification refers to the alignment of EGFR with the current KDGO CKD stages. These green curves represent black populations and the orange curve represents non-black populations. And you can see here for the current 2009 or the old equation, that there's some bias um, in for black participants and negative sign means there's, there, that there's overestimation for both non-black and black participants using the old 2009 equation. And then if we looked at the uh, non-black reporting, if we took that non-black value, that old value and use it for everybody, that there's actually bias. Um, so then underestimation for black participants and a slight overestimation for non-black participants really unchanged as you can see from the older equation, but I think really what's important here because a lot of people attacked institutions for removing the race coefficient and just reporting the non-black for everybody is that the P30 is robust. It's actually very similar to the older 2009 equation when they had two different black versus non-black uh, reporting. And so a lot of institutions were using this prior to our recommendations coming out. But for this new equation, the, the new equation that was, again, refit without race, so you're just looking at age, sex, and serum creatinine, you can see that there's some underestimation for Black participants and overestimation for non-Black participants really in, 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 the, in different directions, but the magnitude is very similar, and that the P30 is robust for this equation. I'll briefly go over the cystatin creatinine equations, and I'll just summarize to say that for the old equation that had race versus the new equation we fit without race, the P30s are, 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 is even better for the new refit equation and that the bias is minimal in either direction. And for cystatin C, again, we know that there's really no um, racial difference and the robust, uh, the P30 is higher than creatinine alone and the bias in either direction for black versus non-black is minimal. And so these are just projections to show you just the kind of effect of these equations on any individual. And you can see if we looked at, for instance, a 50 year old, year old man who has a creatinine of two using the current equation, um, his EGFR would be 44, but if we switch to the new equation, it would be 40. So really a minimal change, right? It's in the same race. There's not gonna really be a change at the same stage. There's not gonna be a change in management here. And for a non-black individual, that magnitude is even less. We have uh, an EGFR of 38 for the current equation and it changes to 40, so it goes slightly up for that man um, using the new equation. Again, minimal change uh, using the new equation and, and no difference in clinical management. So I think that allays a lot of people's fears that, oh my goodness, this is gonna be such a huge shift. But as again, as you move down the, low, the EGFR spectrum, when you get to the smaller numbers, you see minimal differences in EGFR with the new change. So in conclusion, the new creatinine equations may introduce inaccuracies for racial groups. However, the magnitudes of inaccuracies were smaller than the 30% margin of error that we say for P30, which is considered adequate for clinical decision-making. We know that the estimates of CKD burden and EGFR stages will change with this new equation, but recognizing that that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? If we're moving towards health equity and we have something that's actually equally accurate as the older equations, 
And we also noted that new creatinine um, to statin C equations really minimize inaccuracies for both racial groups and minimize differences in estimated CKD pre prevalence because it is the most accurate um, equation. And again, this is the combined equation without race. So on September 23rd, the same day that the New England Journal publication came out, the task force re uh, released our final recommendations. And we said that we would want to, one, immediately implement this equation across the country, and hopefully other countries will do the same. Um, and that we should really focus on national efforts to increase uh, access to cystatin C. Again, we know that that's another biomarker that does not show racial differences is actually more accurate, especially when you combine it with creatinine um, and detecting and managing a, a kidney disease. And that we should also be mindful that um, we need better biomarkers. So we should continue to push for even better biomarkers that do not use race that could even be better than creatinine to statin C. We should also focus our efforts on other interventionals and other interventions to eliminate race and ethnic disparities, knowing that this change in EGFR equations is one piece of the pie. It's not going to by any means get rid of racial disparities. Again, we know that that's due to structural racism anyway. So tweaking this is not going to change that. But for the reasons that I've described, it's the right thing to do moving forward. And so future approaches to using race, I'll end here. We should be using again, EGFR equations or other measures of kidney function that do not use race. And we really need rigorous research to investigate previously accepted notions of racial differences. Again, I showed you that figure from our Nature Nephrology Reviews paper that really tries to, ga to gauge the impact of structural racism. And we need more research to look at that. I know that there's two papers out right now that look at the association of discrimination with EGFR. It's associated with lower EGFR. I think the next natural step is to look at measured GFR so we can really see the impact on kidney function and other environmental eff effects that we haven't previously studied. And we need transparency in discussing EGFR determination with our patients. Why have we used it in the past? What are the limitations? What are we doing going forward to make sure that this doesn't happen again? So in summary, structural racism contributes to disparate health outcomes among racial and ethnic minorities in the United States, not inherent biological differences. I want to be very clear, if you can take one takeaway from this, it's that. The pitfalls of using race and EGFR equations include delays in access to general and specialty nephrology care, racial bias, and a lack of transparency. And while research is ongoing to develop even better filtration markers, we should again use a new equation, urinary creatinine clearance, or direct measurement of GFR to inform clinical decisions if you have access to exogenous biomarkers. So I'll show my funding resources and my contact information and a shameless plug to follow me on Twitter. And I'll take any questions. Great. Thank you so much. Maybe we can stop sharing. Uh, perfect. Such a wonderful overview. I really enjoyed it. And I think um, for me, the other take home message, um, which I, I hope all of our trainees in particular take heart is how important it is to go back to the original literature and understand the studies that drive what we consider our standards of care now. Um, and um, be able to reevaluate and reinterpret um, those original studies to know what their own inherent biases are in, in, in constructing our current standard. It really, I think, is important, even though it may mean using microfiche sometimes. Uh, <laughs> so a um, couple of questions that have come up. So in terms of GFR, uh, is is there any value or uh, of using change in GFR over time versus a single point to determine um, a diagnosis of kidney disease or um, readiness for transplant? So is the slope of that change more important or less important? Absolutely, and I, I forgot to mention that on my last slide, but having transparency with our, our uh, discussions with our patients, we should talk about the limitations of EGFR and how, yes, looking at trends over time is significantly more important than looking at any single cut point. I mean, I'm sure we've had a lot of patients that their EGFR fluctuates, and as soon as you see somebody's EGFR drop below 30, you're not going to just discontinue their metformin, right? You're going to look at the net, you're going to ask them to recheck, ask them their clinical situation at the time where they dehydrated, what happened, uh, maybe use a different biomarker or a way of ascertaining kidney function. This is part of shared decision making we should be doing when it comes to EGFR. And so, yes, slope is absolutely um, very important. Um, and just a, a, a comment from uh, Jay Wernley, 
uh, also emphasizing um, often women are marginalized in the healthcare system and their um, uh, signs and symptoms are dismissed um, uh, from inherent biases and that we should be cognizant of that. Mm -hmm. uh, important. Totally agree. Uh, so. Question from uh, Betsy Trowbridge. So maybe a little bit out of your, uh, uh, is out of nephrology, but another area of controversy is um, using, uh, adjusting for race uh, in neurocognitive testing. Uh, do you have any insight into that or your thoughts on that? Yes, I know there's a huge lawsuit for the NFL, and I know that that's, uh, that's going to go away likely soon. I don't think any race, automatic race correction should be used at all. I'll comment on that. And I know that the New England Journal published all of the race algorithms, I think it was the summer of 2020, that, sh that have automatic race correction. And I know different societies are rapidly changing the way that they use those, changing the tools and making sure that that is not included in their tools. So that is ongoing. That won't happen anymore, I believe. Okay. Um, question from Laura Morsetter, one of our nephrologists. So one of the other areas um, uh, used in nephrology is the APOL1, the um, apolipoprotein L1 variants uh, for kidney disease. Do you want to comment on um, the appropriate approach to evaluation using uh, that data? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I think that, you know, this is come up time and time again that ApoL1 should be used in place of black race. I, I don't agree with that. Um, I do think that ApoL1 exists, you know, that's been published that ApoL1 exists beyond people who identify of black race. There's people who are of, from Hispanic um, or Latino countries that also have significant um, profiles of high risk ApoL1. Um, and you can also see it in certain areas of, of Europe. And so I think the biggest question is how, I think ABOL1 is a great biomarker. I know Vertex just announced um, some, some great data for some novel therapies that target ABOL1 disease. I think the question is, you know, do we offer it to everybody, right? Because we, all, we actually don't really know um, too much in terms of who, how we should um, risk stratify people, right? We also, we know that the, there's 13% of black individuals, for instance, that have a high risk profile of ApoL1. Um, and what do we do with that, right? Not everybody that has a high risk profile progresses to kidney failure. So I don't, you know, I think it's, it's really kind of a, we're all waiting the Apollo trial um, to see uh, the results of that and how best to manage ApoL1. But I do think it will be used much more routinely in transplant decision-making, I'm not sure how ApoL1 be, will be used in EGFR. I, I think that there, there needs to be um, a, lot, a lot of data to look at that to see if that is a, an option. I, it might be, but I think that we still have a lot to learn about ApoL1 before we get to a point of, for instance, um, poly kid, polycystic kidney disease and how we use that, that genetic profile in our management of, of kidney disease. Okay, a okay. Um, couple of more questions. So, um, <clears throat> so, Contextual level factors, episomes, including neighborhood disadvantage metrics, have also been strongly linked to structural inequities, such as redlining, and are increasingly recognized as factors which impact biological health outcomes independently of individual level variables. Are you aware of any efforts to incorporate these contextual level episome factors in nephrology? Yes. So I, so in the front, well, yes, well, my work, uh, I know that the area deprivation index, I'm not sure if people have heard that, of it. That Amy Kind is the, um, art who asked the question is the, the author of that. Oh, okay, great. Oh, nice to meet you, Dr. Kind. I'm a big fan of your work. Um, I, that is being used increasingly. I actually have not seen it used um, in nephrology. So I, I'm definitely interested in that. And I would love to partner with you on looking at that. Cause I think that as people are moving towards AI and more kind of hospital algorithms on predicting readmissions and things like that, that is incredibly important and, and more salient than, and than race. Um, so I'm excited about the future when it comes to ADI. Yeah. I, I will, uh, hook you two up because you Great. guys definitely talk. Um, that's Question great. from Brad Astor in nephrology. Also, um, uh, what about the current recommendations? Are they being adopted internationally? Um, how is that being rolled out in different countries? 
That's a great question. I just did a podcast from some colleagues across the pond in the UK, um, and they've actually been watching the United States very closely. I, I think it's been really interesting, and they're they're a big fan. They are they removed race um, from their EGFR, their national kind of nephrology guidelines. I think every country is going to do a deep dive into their data. Some countries do actually have ethnicity adjustments, like China. Certain areas of China have different adjustments for their population. So I think everyone's kind of trying to move forward to the most accurate equation without using the specified ethnicities. Um, so will it be taken, will it be uptaken in the in international guidelines? I think there's some people pushing for that. I'm not sure if that will actually happen though. Okay. Uh, and then uh, final question, are you aware of other issues in nephrology that are also being re-examined for um, potential biases and the inclusion of race in uh, any other calculations or measurements? Absolutely. So there's the, um, the risk tools for the, uh, kidney donors and kidney recipients that have Black race in them. I know people are attacking that currently. So that, that's coming. Um, and I think people feel very strongly about not using race in um, donor and, uh, and recipient evaluation, evaluations. And so um, that's forthcoming. Okay, great. Um, and then just a, a, a slew of comments, just commending you for an outstanding presentation and uh, several cheers for Nigeria. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for Nigeria, thank you so much. So thank you for really uh, a, a, an amazing presentation, really thought provoking, uh, and um, I, I really enjoyed it. So hope to see you in person and we'll have cheese curds. Yes, yeah, sounds great. Thank you for having me. Have a great weekend, everybody. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.